Welcome to Bonnie's Beat. I'm your host, Bonnie Squires. We're coming to you from Radnor Studio 21 in the heart of downtown Wayne. We like to bring to your attention interesting people who are doing something important, whether it's charities, or it's academia, or it's medicine, or it's music, or theater. And we have a very interesting guest today who is multifaceted. Her name is Kathy Buchvar, and she is the executive director of the Bryn Mawr Birthing Center. Hello, Kathy. Hi, Bonnie. Thanks for having me. Um, so you went from the frying pan into the fire, from running for Congress <laughs> to uh, about to shepherd the 10,000th baby at the birth center. Unbelievable. And the timing of this interview could not be more perfect. <laughs> we are, as of now, we have two babies to go before we hit 10,000. Well, we're taping uh, on December 3rd, and it will be aired Monday, which is de December 8th, I think. So maybe so it should be it today or tomorrow, the Ooh. December 2nd or 3rd, I think, is um, if I were a betting woman, I'd put some serious money on it. It's very interesting. It just worked out this way, but my best friend has been in California for the past nine days awaiting the birth of her first grandchild. Oh, and congratulations. And yesterday, her gynecologist finally said, I'm doing a cesarean at 5 o'clock this afternoon. So my girlfriend calls me and says, she's doing a cesarean at 5 o'clock. And it only took 45 minutes. Wow. I said, it's like they unzipped her and pulled baby Abigail out. It's amazing. So that's wow. so this is very appropriate that I've got the executive director of the birth center in the studio today. Now, tell me how you got involved with the Bryn Mawr Birth Center. Well, you know, it's um, you never know what's going to come your way, and I feel incredibly fortunate for the experiences that I've had in my life. Um, so I was chief counsel for the Pennsylvania Auditor General. Translation, she was a very bright attorney. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I got a call from a woman who was the recruiter looking to hire for a nonprofit, a women's health nonprofit in southeastern Pennsylvania. And I didn't know her, and she didn't know me, but she had received it, uh, somebody suggested that she call me, and what she didn't know is that 16 years ago, I had birthed my own daughter with midwives also in an out-of-hospital birthing suite, and so already had the connection and the commitment to natural childbirth and empowering and educating women to be able to make decisions they can for their own bodies and for their children and their family um, decisions. So, How did you have the nerve not to be in a hospital to deliver a baby. Well, and I didn't realize, I thought the birth center was at Bryn Mawr Hospital. It's not, actually. It's right across the street from Bryn Mawr Hospital. Aha, uh -huh, the plot so, thickens. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a nonprofit. It's an independent nonprofit, 501c3, that was founded in 1978. As does it belong to Bryn Mawr Hospital? It does not. It is fully oh, independent. This is very educational for me. <laughs> I'm sure so, for my audience as well. I, you know, I think there's a lot of people that don't know a lot about what we do. And so let me tell you and let me tell everybody um, because this is a phenomenal organization. And, um, you know, there's a lot of women who are choosing out of hospital births. And if you're a low risk, which the huge majority of people are, the fact is, is that most pregnancies are very natural and very healthy and we provide so we are a team of we have about 40 to 45 people on staff and we are have nurse midwives certified nurse midwives who have an incredible amount of training and their license and they have continuing professional education um, we have nurse practitioners also certified and you know continuing professional education lots of strong background as well as registered nurses and so that's our clinical team and they provide all the same services that you might get from an OBGYN. So everything from prenatal and before, um, as far as the childbirth piece of this is, is concerned, all the way through after childbirth. And it's a wonderful, home-like, nurturing relationship between the provider and the patient. 
Do you stick people in a tub of warm water? <laughs> we don't stick people anywhere. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we do have jacuzzis in every room, in every birth suite, and you can choose, certainly, to be in the jacuzzi during labor. We don't do water births, but you could be in during labor, and a lot of women find it really comforting and um, helpful to get through labor. To get through labor. Where were you when you had a midwife 16 years ago? In the Lehigh Valley. So we were with another practice. Were in your practice. home? Or you were no, no. We had birth suites as well. Um, oh. And, you know, I had sort of happened upon it by accident. I didn't know anybody who had ever done that before. But I knew that I wanted to explore it. And I'll tell you what, it was wonderful. You can move around. And this is how it is at the birth center as well. Rather than being, you know, lying on a bed the whole time during labor, you can move around. There's a large, you know, it's almost like being in a bed and breakfast. So there's a lot of different ways to, people that like different things that make their process easier for them. But you could have your spouse or partner there, you can have your children there, you could have your mother there, your best friend, um, whoever you want to sort of help you through the process. It's really a wonderful way to give birth. What happens if there is some kind of problem? Very good question. So, you know, we're right across the street from Bridmar Hospital, and we also have a relationship with Delaware County Memorial Hospital. So, we, there are times that we use both, or eat, not both, but each. Um, so, the majority, as I said, the majority of births are, are able to birth right at the birth center. But if there's a problem, we transfer to the hospital. And it's so easy, and the teams of doctors that we work with are phenomenal. Uh, I'm still thinking about your comparison that the birth center is like a bed and breakfast. Most people don't go home with the baby from a bed and <laughs> breakfast, however. <laughs> it's a bonus. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it's really, it really is like being in a home environment. Um, I'd love you to come take a tour at some point. It's really, we have um, three birth suites and, you know, beautiful, large bed. Like I said, there's a jacuzzi tub. We have rocking chairs. We have lots of com comfortable areas. Plus, there's a full kitchen. Television so could, set? Television set, of course. Of course. And we have a back... Computer? Com we have computers. Most people, I think, don't choose to use computers during <laughs> well, labor, yes, you know. <laughs> but, but if they did, I'm sure we could make that available. Um, we have an outside patio area, which is also lovely. So during the nicer weather, people could walk around outside and spend some time in our garden, which is really phenomenal. How old is the birth center? 36 years. Oh, my goodness. I had no idea. Yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah, and it's... Yeah, it's funny because there's been so much building between Bryn Mawr and Lankanaw, and they're in the news all the time. And then, you know, and then Mainline Health kind of dissolved and they made new alliances and so on. And I always thought the birth center was part of Bryn Mawr Hospital. So I'm, I'm really happy, Kathy, that you're the executive director. We get to inform people that it's a separate nonprofit. It's really, and, you know, it's, it's, our location is fabulous, of course, because it gives people a lot of security to know that they can be there, but know they have easy access to the hospital just in case. You're um, right on County Line Road. We are. We are literally oh. across Let's the street. Let's put the phone number up on, on the screen if we can at this time. Okay. 610-525-6086, www.thebirthcenter.org, and then Facebook. Twitter, oy vey. <laughs> <laughs> I managed somehow a few years ago, I don't know how I did it, but I was able to create a Facebook page for myself and a Twitter account. I've never figured out how to get back into Twitter and use it. When I get something from Twitter, it shows up as an email. I'm great with email, you know, on my computer. And Facebook, every once in a while, I'll, you know, answer or I'll, you know, I'll click uh, and send a message to somebody who sent me something. But what do people find if they go to your Facebook page? Oh, well, right now, Bonnie, there's been a serious countdown to 10,000. So the really wonderful thing about the birth center, among lots of wonderful things, is the connection that people 
forge with the birth center and our midwives and nurses. And it's unlike anything you've ever seen with, you know, in terms of like a patient provider relationship, this is more like family. And so we started earlier this year, a meet the, the birth center staff um, series. And the first one that we did was a feature for one of our midwives that's been there a particularly long time. Her name is Gazelle. And Bonnie, to see the stories that people posted, just to share how they felt about their experiences with Gazelle was so heartwarming. I mean, I think we were all crying all the time isn't, to see. Isn't that wonderful? It's truly, <clears throat> it's, it's the most nurturing provider-client relationship I have ever seen in my life. and. So right now, you know, there's this countdown to 10,000, but it's not just about that one baby. That 10,000 babies, they're waiting for the birth of the 10,000th baby at the birth center. How did they know to keep count from the beginning 36 years ago? We have a birth log. Jeez. And so actually we're going to be having a party to celebrate the 10,000 babies, um, and that's on December 14th. And we're going to offer people, if you know, some people never knew their birth numbers, um, but there are going to be multi-generational birth center families that come to the party. And so we've said to people, if you want to know your birth number or your child's birth number or your grandchild's birth number, come and we'll make sure to pull it up and then you'll <laughs> know. But, you know, people have the place where we're having the party is called Open Connections. I don't know if you're familiar with it. No, I'm not. It's wonderful, beautiful, beautiful location, um, not too far from here. And it... Um, it is owned by Baby 99, <laughs> and her, her father, her parents, were one of the original founders and supporters of the birth center. Um, and she, Baby 99, had three children also at the birth center. So it's just, it really is like an extended family. That's incredible. 10,000, to keep track of 10,000. <laughs> you want to do a family tree, it would be two blocks long. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> But without any dysfunction, you know. It's well, let's let's find out some more about Kathy Buchvar. I know Kathy because she was an outstanding candidate for Congress recently. Unfortunately, she didn't get there. The Republicans kind of swept away everything the last election. We won't talk about that. <laughs> I'm waiting for Hillary. <laughs> Hillary's going to come and redeem all of us. Okay, but uh, tell us. Where, where you grew up, where you went to high school, where you went to college? Sure. Um, I grew up in New York, about 45 minutes outside New York City. Went to Hewlett High School. You don't have an accent Thank from you. Hewlett. Thank <laughs> you. Because I went to camp with, with the Hewlett and the Madison and, right? and, and the uh, Bieber and Overbrook. And the kids, you could cut with a knife their accents, the one that came from <laughs> New York. <laughs> My mother taught us when we were, you know, growing up, enunciate. So I think I lost the, the New York accent quickly. So th thanks, Mom. Um, so yeah, I went to University of Pennsylvania for college. So that was my, my first alma mater. Oh, is that yeah, right? Yeah, sure. So wonderful. I'm coming up on my 25th reunion next year. Um, and then I went to American University Washington College of Law for law school. Graduated from law school in 93, so I graduated from Penn in 90, law school in 93, met my husband at law school, and um, I always loved Pennsylvania since I went to college here, really, and so we moved Penn to Pennsylvania. Penn does that to people. There are so many people that come from out of town to go to Penn, and then they end up staying. It is, it is, it is that environment. There's something about it that just makes you want to stay. Um, so... Yeah, we moved to Pennsylvania. Actually, we moved to rural northeastern Pennsylvania, to the Endless Mountains originally. I never even heard of the Endless Mountains. Uh, to me, I lived in Harrisburg for three years and worked there, and I always thought if you go past Harrisburg, you fall off the end of the earth, you know? <laughs> I mean, if you can't see Bloomingdale's or Wanamaker's, that's it. That's the end of civilization. It's, it's beautiful up there. We moved to Tunkhannock, which is Wyoming I've heard County. I've it's a great, it's a great place, a great place to start a legal career. It was very, um, it's very rural. So there was one judge and one public defender, and I was the one legal services lawyer for Wyoming County, Susquehanna County, and half of Sullivan County. They've got more elk than people up there, right? That's <laughs> probably right. <laughs> but it's beautiful. You know, we rented an old 200-year-old stagecoach in, and 
you know, it was just, it was a phenomenal place to live. And I did legal services work, so I was doing work. That was my first nonprofit work and um, was doing free legal, emergency legal services for low income, disabled, and senior clients. And then we gradually moved further down in Pennsylvania to Bucks County. And I worked at Lehigh Valley Legal Services for a couple of years in, in Bethlehem. And then I opened my own practice, and my husband and I had our own law practice for about 11 years. What was, what was your major focus with your, your private law firm? Um, mostly employment law and wills and estates, social security, um, so a mix, you know. So we would do, I would do gender discrimination cases. Um, oh, I'm, that's a hot topic these days. Hot topic. It broke my heart that Bill Cosby, whom I adore, felt that he had to resign from the Board of Trustees at Temple. <clears throat> because when I worked at Temple, though my degrees are from Penn, he was so fabulous. He was such a phenomenal ambassador for Temple University. You, couldn't, you could never calibrate how much it was worth to have the hottest show on television starring a Temple alumnus who would wear a Temple sweatshirt like in every scene. So it broke my heart. And I, well, you're an attorney. We could ask you that question. <laughs> I mean, there's never been an indictment, but the press has tarred and feathered him, and people were running away from him in droves and canceling things. Uh, initially, um, a couple of friends of mine who were on the board of trustees at Temple had gone in print in the Inquirer defending Cosby and saying they don't want to push him off the board. And I sent them congratulatory emails. And then a few days later, Cosby announces that he's resigned. And the chairman of the board, who's an attorney, big attorney in town, was very quick to accept it. And I, I think that's a mistake. I feel very bad. I mean, they've kind of destroyed a man. Uh, you know, people say, well, if there are that many women claiming, but I'm thinking about the Salem witch trials where all those little girls got hysterical and insisted somebody was a witch and they saw them flying and so on. I don't know. What, what was your reaction? You know, I don't know the facts. I think it's really hard for us who all think of Bill Cosby as, you know, our uncle or something, you know, and... Um, I, I don't know enough because you can't get into, you can't put yourself in the situation until you've been there. Um, so, you know, with the 24-hour news cycle and with everything being public, it, it every, you know, it's sort of the good news and the bad news. Um, well, the real damaging thing was the one woman who, who got the Washington Post to print her op-ed. I mean, because the Washington Post has a reputation since Watergate of being a reliable source Right. So, but I still feel terrible. I mean, I feel terrible for the women if they're, if the allegations are true for having lived yeah. with this for a long time. So it's that's, sort of... That's true. That's true. Uh, anyway, let's get back to so. the waiting for the 10,000th baby. Is <laughs> it, are, are they going to blow trumpets or what are they going to do when the 10,000th baby arrives at the birth center. <laughs> Probably depends what hour it is. <laughs> I don't think our, you know, our neighbors would be that happy with blowing no. trumpets in the middle of the night. Well, um, it's, it's a funny business, right? Because you can't predict anything with, when it comes to pregnancy and labor. So, um, you know, as it gets closer, it's a little more able to be predicted. And I, as I said, I would put money on uh, it being in the next 24 hours or so. Um, but so we're going to have some nice gifts for our families. Of course, you know, the, we'll also have gifts for 9999 and 10,001 because they'll be that <laughs> close. Um, and then we're going to have this huge celebration on the 14th. And the, that really is intended to celebrate all 10,000 babies and the families that have. How many people do you expect to come to that celebration? Hundreds of people. Yes, there's a lot of interest. Have they RSVP'd already? They have. Oh yeah, my goodness. hundreds and hundreds of people have been RSVPing. We've been putting out the feelers. And again, it goes back to that connection that is truly unique. And it's a community. So not only is there the Facebook page that they put up on the screen, but which I'm sure will be put up again. Um, but we'll, we'll put it up again. Great. Here we go www.thebirthcenter.org, 610-525-6086. And you can find The Birth Center on Facebook, Facebook and Twitter, at TBC Bryn Mawr. That's TBC stands for The Birth Center? Correct. TBC Bryn Mawr. Okay, well, 
I'll try to get into it when I get home. Yeah, the Facebook page is really a good place to sort of feel, feel the love in both directions and the excitement surrounding, you know, all our, we have a, a great communications and development director who's been, um, really, we've been trying to keep up with the numbers as they happen, but of course, sometimes you have two happen overnight and it skips, but all you have to do is put up a number and, you know, hundreds of people like, like, because it's very exciting. It's people, and we, we actually are selling, oh, I'm sorry, I meant to bring you and to hold up. We have onesies that talk about, that say it's raining babies. We have umbrellas. Oh, is that we cute? have we have tote bags. So if you're looking for swag, <laughs> we have birth center swag. <laughs> Be a part of the ten thousand. Is it for sale? Babies. Is it for sale? It's for sale. Absolutely. Is it on the website? Um, go go to the Facebook page. Um, I I'm not sure that it's on the website yet. Oh, but it's so, on the Facebook page. But it's on page. the Facebook page. There are links to it. And we'll, we'll make a point. I will go from here, and we will put it on the Facebook page. So, on the What's link. the T-shirt going to say for the 10,000th baby or the onesie for the 10,000th actual baby? So, um, well, the, I, I think that those are going to say this, what they say, which is the, the onesie says um, it's raining babies at the birth center and then celebrating 10,000 babies. And then the t-shirts say, proud to be a part of the first 10,000 babies at the birth center. So, and we have tote bags, we have chapstick. Um, <laughs> my personal favorite. <laughs> so there's quite a few things. That, that's funny. I'm thinking of the t-shirts where somebody goes away and they buy a t-shirt for the grandchild and it says, my grandfather went to Disney World, and all I got was his lousy T-shirt. But these sound like they're a lot nicer. <laughs> these are, and they're purple. They're <laughs> vibrant purple. Oh. Um, they're really, they're fun. And there's been a lot of people signing up for them. And I'm guessing we're going to sell out and have to order more very quickly. So you said you have a staff of forty, between forty and forty-five. Yes. Well, if you only have three of the birth center rooms, why do you need forty people? Who are the forty? Good question. Um, so our it's about half clinical and half non-clinical. So we have between um, generally between about ten and twelve midwives, about ten and twelve nurses, um, and but we're we do women's health the whole continuum of women's health. And so, for example, if you have a daughter who's you know entering adolescence and doesn't want to go to her pediatrician anymore, and she really wants to talk to somebody who will listen to her and answer her questions, come to the birth center. The the amount of time that we spend with our patients and clients is unlike anywhere else. Um, we spend at least a half an hour with every appointment. Some appointments are an hour. Mm. Because that's really about hearing, hearing the whole picture, having a holistic approach to healthcare. Um, we also, on the other end of the spectrum, if you're you know, entering menopause and you know, I think it can, there's a lot of questions that you have, and um, you want to speak to somebody who really knows the field. These are women, the midwives and nurses are women who really understand and will listen and will help you through it. And, and you know, a lot of people don't realize that, in, that um, certified midwives can write prescriptions. So, I didn't know that. Yeah, so it's really, um, it's an incredibly full service. If you need a well woman exam, if you need a gynecological exam, um, if you just are going through something at whatever point of your life and you want to be with a provider who will really listen and guide you through it, the birth center is the place for that. I would assume that the PBS fabulous series called The Midwife has done a lot to raise awareness about the role that a midwife can play, although it's set in like, what, the 1930s or 1940s, and I didn't realize that that's a big thing in 2014 as well. Absolutely, in fact, you know what? It's growing tremendously. The demand for out-of-hospital births and midwife-led births has grown exponentially um, over the last decade in particular, but if you look at the statistics, this is an area that people more and more are saying, you know what, I want to be somewhere where they talk to me about options, that I can have control. There's a lot that we all can't control, but let me have control over what I can control. And if I'm healthy um, and, you know, and I want to have a natural <coughs> supported birth, the birth center is a great place to do that. What happens if somebody says, 
Give me a shot. I can't stand the pain. So absolutely, I mean, that goes back to the being able to transfer to the hospital. So You can't give a shot at the birth center? We don't do epidurals, if that's what you mean. Yes. So yes, we don't have epidurals at the birth center. Okay. So there are other means of, you know, lesser pain support. Um, every, and that's both um, behavioral support that helps people through pain, including jacuzzis. A lot of people, when they're going through the pain of labor, find the jacuzzi very um, relieving. Um, but then there's birthing balls. There's all kinds of different ways. What's a birthing ball? So you've probably seen them, you might see them at the gym and you know if you've ever gotten a physical therapy you see them there as well. Um, they're a big giant rub, ball and that and there you can lean on it and roll on it in various, not roll completely, I think that's probably not a good idea, but there's different positions that people find very comforting. Interesting. Yeah. Do you do any hands-on work at the birth center? I mean, by hands-on, I don't do any clinical work because I'm not a clinician. Uh, the legal training didn't quite get to that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, you know, I manage and administer the operations of the birth center. How long have you been the executive director of the birth center? Uh, it's going on a year, not very long. And what do you, if you were to look into a globe to the future, do you see that you would ever run for office again? You know, it's a good question, and I don't know the answer. Um, I'm really happy where I am. I mean, I have to say that the um, it's such a breath of fresh air to be in a be in a place like the birth center where the motivation for the employees. First of all, I have to talk about. I have to sing the praises of the team at the birth center. The staff at the birth center are the most phenomenally dedicated people I've ever met in my life. So. You know, I've been having been in politics and government um, to be in a place where the sole motivating factor is providing the best quality of care and access to care in women and families is such a wonderful thing. And there's no power motivation or you know control. It's all about providing the best quality of care to women and families. And so right now, at this point, this is a wonderful thing to be doing. Do you use your legal skills as executive director? Absolutely. Um, there's a lot of legal analysis. There's contracts. There's legal analysis. There's um, lots of different factors that go into it. Yes, so it's been nice because I feel like that's been a plus. What's your favorite color? Purple. <laughs> oh, I'm a blue person myself. What are the walls painted, or they're all different colors? They're different. We actually, are, it's, it's funny that you ask. It's as if you know that we have three, the birth suites, each are named by their color. So we've got the yellow room, the blue room, the green room. The green room would make me nauseous. <laughs> I have an aversion to green. I had my colors done one time, and when they put some, you know, green swatches next to my face, everybody around the table started to laugh hysterically and said, Bonnie, it looks as if you need a blood transfusion. <laughs> so, so I said, it's a light. That's that's why I found out why I love uh, peach and hot pink and navy blue and black. But there were, if there's a lot of blue in the green, if it's a teal blue, I can get away with that. I have one pantsuit that's teal blue. <laughs> but other than that, green is not my color. So it's funny that, but people do have a proclivity for certain colors. And it has a psychological effect as well. What's one of the things that's really funny is a lot of when people come back for their second child, they often have a connection with the room that they were in. So they'll say, if at all possible, I really want to birth this child in the blue room because that's where my first child was. And I love that. Again, it's, it shows you the connection. You would never hear that about a hospital room. No, you, know? no, you wouldn't. You wouldn't yeah. hear it about a hospital room. Well, let's throw those numbers up on the screen again before we run out of time. It's 610-525-6086, and it's www.thebirthcenter.org, and Facebook and Twitter at TBC Bryn Mawr. Well, Kathy Buchvar, thank you so much, and continued success at the Birth Center, which is in Bryn Mawr, but it's not part of the Bryn Mawr Hospital. That's so right. this has been very educational. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bonnie. Really and, appreciate it. And we'll see everybody next week. Sounds great.